Hello and welcome to the Functional Forum. We are in beautiful Park City, Utah at the perfect time of year for an incredible conference on one of the hottest topics in our field, mitochondria. We came to the A4M conference that was built around this topic and we're gonna hear from some of the leading researchers, some incredible clinical content and practitioners putting this into action in the field. It's gonna be a super valuable hour, enjoy. We are going to hear from Dr. Andrew Heyman, and I believe that his talk is one of the most crucial that I've seen in 10 years of doing the Functional Forum, because it deals with the central concept of how do we fuse the concepts of vitalism and science into one unified paradigm, and the mitochondria may hold the key for that conversation. Here are some of the best bits from his incredible presentation. Enjoy. So... Before I jump into the deep end of the pool, I wanted to kind of set a context for this whole discussion. And the, the sort of proposition to me was this notion of silos to salugenesis, meaning how do we go from the current medical model in the way that we see patients and we divide up their physiology, and we assign specialists, and now Humpty Dumpty is kind of fully broken apart and we don't know how to put him or her back together. But it's all disease orientation, and, and, and you know this. But then there's this other side, this salugenesis, which goes by a lot of other labels and names, whether it's just health or wellness or longevity or vitality. What is that? And I think we're all here because we have an instinct for that notion. Many of us departed our normal practices because we were dissatisfied. You know, we were kind of going through our days and checking the boxes. And I remember as a family physician at University of Michigan, feeling like at some point, what am I doing for people? I'm satisfying the needs of the insurance company. I'm satisfying the needs of my department in terms of adhering to clinical care guidelines. And my asthmatics got their correct meds, and the hypertensives got their correct meds, and my heart failure patients were monitored properly, but nobody was getting better. And I thought, something's wrong. Something's broken. And we're all in this um, almost fugue state that we've convinced ourselves so deeply that the way we see the world through the normal medical model is all there is, and it's the right thing to do. And so how do you break out of that? And what's the roadmap? Is there one that's not just conceptual, but practical and clinical as well? And that's what we fight for as a community, which is to sort of reframe that idea and to seek ways to build health in our patients. I would also imagine a lot of you, like, like me, um, probably had your own health challenges. It's one of the big reasons why practitioners find their way into this space, because there's no, no better way to sort of see the limits of medicine than to get sick yourself. And I certainly went through it for many, many, many years. Uh, I got quite sick from Lyme, didn't know it. I had it for probably seven or eight years. And I remember the tick bite, I remember the early symptoms, and I remember blowing it all off because I wasn't trained to really care about it. And my health sort of slowly declined. I finally figured it out only because I had moved from Michigan to Virginia and started to see a lot of patients who were really sick. And listening to their stories, I thought, boy, I'm starting to sound just like them. And that got me curious. Uh, I remember at the time I got bit by the tick, I was training for an Ironman and was very, very fit. And I think that was one of the reasons why my health slowly declined, that it wasn't just all at once. 
but I woke up one day and I couldn't run anymore. I was winded, my knees hurt, and I felt like something had changed. But I ignored all that, like we all do. We're overworked, we're stressed, we're in training, we have families, and you sort of dismiss this stuff until one day you can't dismiss it anymore. And I was rotating with a neurologist as a family physician resident and he looked at me and he said, you know, you've got a Bell's palsy. I mean, and I said, yeah, I've noticed that the other day. I have a Bell's palsy, you know? <laughs> Should we go see your next patient, you know? And it's classic, right? I mean, there's no insight at some point. We just keep ignoring the warning signs. And he's like, you should get this checked out. And you know, my face is like, I'm like, why? What's the point, you know? What am I gonna do about it? And looking back, it was another sign of the Lyme disease. So when I finally sort of woke up to that notion, I started treating myself, I put myself on antibiotics for a year. I mean, I super saturated my tissues and did the whole Lyme literate MD thing. Took the herbs, did, did all of it, and only felt slightly better for a moment and then got right back to being sick again. I'm like, oh, I must have a persister infection and they're in the cyst form now and I didn't use the right antibiotics and maybe I should use Buner or Byron White or, you know, Cowden or I should do ozone therapy or sauna or detox, you know, I'm not getting better. But then I heard about a guy in the Eastern Shore who was talking a lot about mold and how that can masquerade as Lyme. And he was doing these weirdo labs that I'd never heard of before, and one of them was something called a C4A. I'd never ordered a C4A. But if you sort of read about it, you realize there's only one lab in the country that runs it properly, and it's National Jewish uh, in Colorado, in Boulder. And I figured out a way to get my sample to National Jewish. I'm like, I'm gonna do a C4A. The upper limit of normal for a C4A is about 2,800. My C4A came back and it was 25,000. And I had this oh shit moment of, no wonder I don't feel good, no wonder I have migraines and I can't remember. I got to the point where I, was, I would see a new patient, do a, an hour and a half intake, face to face, and then a month later they would come back to review their labs and I deliver a plan. I had no recollection of meeting them. I had to take, I learned to take such copious notes and even little details about the name of their dog and the name of their kid and where they went to school and to act like I really knew them. And that was a scary moment where I was in my 30s and I was losing my memory. So I had this high C4A, I didn't feel good, I'd lost my health and I figured out that something else was going on with me, I was working and living in mold. And my brain and my body was literally melting because that's what the inflammation does. It tears down organs and tissues and it damages the brain. And in 2014, I met Dr. Shoemaker. I invited him to my clinic. I asked him to do some lectures for me. And we started talking about the whole subject and I said, who else is doing research on this? You've, you've got some, you've published some. He's like, I'm not getting any help. I said, well, I used to run a big research center at Michigan, I've got a good background in biostatistics and epidemiology. Um, I worked with NIH for years. I'm gonna help you because there's no roadmap for this. There's no brochure. No one is doing the research, so let's do it together. So he and I started collecting data on brain scans in 2014, the NeuroQuant, and then we opened our transcriptomics research lab in 2015. We began looking at patterns of gene expression. And we took the deep dive into what is the roadmap of what's directing the body of how to work or not work. And we first started looking at 30,000 genes, the full range of protein encoding genes, and then 9,000 and 7,000 and 800 and 600. And now we're down to 188 genes that drive the way the body responds to Lyme and mold and COVID and algae and all sorts of biotoxins. And we've learned a tremendous amount about how these genes behave and what they do. So how does this all intersect with the theme of today? Well, guess what? 
all 188 genes are mitochondrial genes. And it turns out that the mitochondria are the main orchestrator of cell responses. It's not the nucleus. The mitochondria are essentially the brains of the cell. So if you want to shift from a disease model to a health model, you need to understand the mitochondria. There is no way around it. So thematically today, we're going to talk about all this. And I know as a community of practitioners and scientists and researchers and academics, we want to answer this question, what is cell eugenesis? But it turns out it's not a new question, and it's one that's actually been dismissed. There's a reason why we don't talk about this. It's not just that there isn't science. It's not that there isn't interest, but there have been social, political, economic, scientific to some degree forces that have sort of arrayed themselves against a deeper investigation of what this is. And it has everything to do with living a full life, of being a whole person, of accessing your best potential, and feeling the best that you can feel. So the good old days, this was in Scientific American in 2002. There's no truth to the fountain of youth. 51 scientists who study aging have issued a warning to the public. No anti-aging remedy on the market today has been proved effective. Disturbingly, large numbers of entrepreneurs are luring gullible and frequently desperate customers of all ages into, quote, longevity clinics, claiming a scientific basis for the anti-aging products they recommend and often sell. At the same time, the internet has enabled those who seek lucre from supposed anti-aging products to reach new customers with ease. They're talking about you. They've labeled you. They've tarred and feathered you. They said you're a threat. They said it's all about the money. And there's no proof. And it's these sorts of things that sort of leak into the consciousness of practitioners. It's very hard to have a discussion with a colleague who only practices conventionally. They don't speak our language. They don't see the world the way we do. And there are many reasons why, and some of it is overt, and some of it is subversive. So, but anyone purporting to offer an anti-aging product today is either mistaken or lying. And you think about what that means. You know, this goes further than just difference of opinion and well-meaning providers who might be chasing pixie dust. This gets into the factions and the camps that we see. And it dismisses the narrative of how do we get our patients healthy? What are the approaches? What are the markers? Is it real? Is it not real? And we're fighting this. Hype and lies. Hype and lies. So on what grounds do we assert so vehemently that no purported anti-aging intervention has been proved to modify aging? To assess whether an intervention has affected a biological process, researchers need a yardstick for measuring that process. In this case, no single or aggregate age-related phenomenon has proved to be a reliable indicator of the rate of aging in humans or other species. Without a yardstick, there can be no measurements, and without measurements, there can be no assurance that an intervention was successful. So they're telling you two things. One is sort of stated, but there's something unstated. The stated is, at the time, there was no measure for longevity. There was no measure to sort of stamp, how old are you, quote? How vital are you? Is there a single metric or a group of metrics that doesn't say, this is your disease state, but it says instead, this is how healthy you are. This is how resilient. This is how robust. This is how uh, you cope in the world mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. They say, oh, none of that exists. So therefore, health doesn't exist which is a kind of a non sequitur, 
but there's that part. But the other part is data. And this gets into the field of, and I don't mean to get too pointy-headed academic, but epistemology, the study of knowledge. How do we know what we know? How do we understand the world around us, the observable world and the non-observable world? And it dismisses thousands of years of human empirical knowledge and the way traditional healing systems came to understand health and illness, and it completely dismisses that whole repository of knowledge. And it says, we don't care about any of that. We are bound and wedded to that scientific model, that sort of discrete, measurable, numerical, objective way of seeing the world. And if I can't do that alone, it doesn't exist. And yet, a lot of us are here because we all have an instinct to want to feel good and feel better, and we want to help our patients feel good and feel better too. And some of that is simple and obvious, moving, breathing, eating well, sleeping deeply, having meaning and purpose in your life, a community and a support network. We all try and find our ways through, and some of it is individual and some of it is kind of collective. I mean, I was shocked. I went to the gym at 5.30 this morning, and a bunch of you were already there, like already sweating at 5.30. And I, you know, I'm like, okay. Um, I bet I know all these people are attending this conference. Um, so I know it's part of us, and there's an instinct for it. So our anti-aging medicine and successful aging, two sides of the same coin views of anti-aging practitioners. So there was a research study that was done and published in 2013, basically it was a survey. And they were asking practitioners about this very issue. They're trying to understand what is the deeper understanding and motivation for this. So discussions about what constitutes successful aging have been ongoing in gerontology since the 50s and 60s. Yet there are no universally shared definitions or measures. A decade later, there are certain models that began to be developed. And there was this notion that how do we define successful aging? A step towards this idea of vitality and wellness and longevity. So he writes, a human being is much more than the sum of blood, bone, and viscera. In the same way, each fragment of truth in itself is a lie. Therefore, the accumulation of unintegrated scientific facts does not protect us against that ignorance. He's talking about how do we put people back together? We can divide them up into silos, we're really good at that, but if, you, if they're all these unintegrated pieces of information, have you translated knowledge into understanding and meaning? I see this all the time with practitioners. We are junkies when it comes to ordering labs on our patients, admit it. You're addicted. That's another support group. <laughs> we love it. Amino acids and fatty acids and nutrient levels and hormones and neurotransmitters and heavy metals and, right? I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And there's always a new panel somewhere, right? Oh, I'm going to measure all the immune activity in your, you know, adaptive immune system or I'm going to now be able to measure your microbiome. It's all microbiome stuff now. So you get these reports back, right? I mean, I've been there. You get this nice report, very colorful. There's about 300 pieces of data on the report. Some is high, some is low, some is normal. Now what? Well, I'm sitting there, now the F what, right? Because it's overwhelming. And you didn't just order one of those reports. You got to review the hormone panel, the neurotransmitter panel, the microbiome panel, the nutrient panel, right? And you have to come up with a plan to get that person healthy. And so what do we do? We kind of fall back on what we know, which is you treat the highs, you treat the lows, you ignore the normals, and you hope for the best. How often does that really work in a really sick patient? Not a lot. 
What are we chasing? So, in the measure that we interrelate a greater number of fragments, the closer we can come to truth, although truth as an absolute is unattainable. Patterns of data. We now have the capacity to go well beyond just the functional measurement tools that are available to us. Forget their validity or not, but we are awash now in data. Wearables and biometrics and apps and blood data and urine data and scans and you know, all the rest, genomic data. Now what? How do you translate all of that data into knowledge? It requires a lot more than just a gestalt, a quick review before you see the patient. This is where I think new mathematical modeling, artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural learning processes, um, technology in general is going to assist us in seeing the patterns in the data on an individual level. We have to. And I also love this quote because this is one of the first encounters of that old and new, the vitalism and the scientific materialism, the East and the West, the technical and the aspirational. This is written by Richard Seltzer. He's a surgeon. He was also a published poet. And he was invited to do rounds with other physicians at Harvard many decades ago when the Dalai Lama was visiting and he brought his personal Tibetan healer physician. And they invited the personal physician to do rounds in the hospital. And you could imagine this sort of wizened Tibetan Buddhist monk in his saffron robes floating from room to room and all the white coats following behind. Right? You know, you know, the, you know the drill. And he's writing about that moment where the personal physician is sitting next to the patient and he says, his eyes are closed as he feels for the pulse. In a moment, he's found the spot and for the next half hour, he remains thus, suspended above the patient like some exotic golden bird with folded wings, holding the pulse of the woman beneath his fingers, cradling her hand in his. All the power of the man seems to be drawn down into this one purpose. And I know that I, who've palpated 100,000 pulses, have not felt a single one. I think there's something in all of us that would love to understand what that's like. To either be able to do that or to even just receive it as a gift. Dr. Seltzer felt the moment he knew something special was happening. And so he's trying to capture what we've lost along the way. And this idea of are we stuck in that scientific materialist model, that siloed model where the lungs are bellows and you know, we have all these mechanical parts that can be replaced now and drugs are powerful and surgery is even more powerful and it all works. But is it, is it the right model to be used all the time under all circumstances? Or do we see our patients also as a system of systems that ebb and flow, that have measures and countermeasures, that we change and evolve and grow, and we operate on all these levels, mind, body, spirit, that we're more an ecosystem rather than a, an assembly of just mechanical parts. And somewhere between these two, I think, is the promise of salugenesis. How do we get here? So, anti-aging medicine, functional medicine, integrative medicine, use whatever term you like. Vitalism and scientific materialism make a baby. We're here to make that baby today. So the principles, we want a type of medicine and approach that's predictive, it's personalized, it's whole person, it's root cause, it's aspirational, and I think there are three drivers to this. 
wellness, bioinformatics, and technology. We, people want to feel healthy, but we need to approach this in a more sophisticated way. And believe it or not, there has now been a recent sea change. The Buck Institute, the Salk Institute, the UCLA Longevity Center. There is a pursuit going on around the world and billions and billions of dollars are being spent now in trying to decode and unlock the human potential. Part of the work has now been able to identify a biological clock. And research centers in England and at Stanford and other major universities have begun to figure out how to actually measure your biological age as opposed to your chronological age. And that old criticism from Scientific American is now starting to go away because the response is, you know what, buddy? We can measure it. What are you going to do about that? It's coming. It's actually here. So the gap between this notion of aspiration and living a great life and pursuing it within a scientific materialistic model has arrived. It's here today. Our work in the mitochondria, I think, begins to define a part of that journey. It's one piece, but it's a piece you just can't ignore. I'm convinced, for me as an educator, running my program at George Washington University, overseeing the entire curriculum at A4M, one of my missions is to help practitioners transition and evolve and grow and become complete in how you see your patients and your toolkit. If you don't get the concepts today, if you don't invest yourself in learning about what we're going to teach you in very practical terms, you're going to miss a number of your patients in your practice that have these issues. And believe it or not, when you start to apply some of our approaches, you're going to be surprised at how many patients you see, but also how many of them you can fix. These are usually some of the hardest patients that you'll see in your practice, by far. All right, I'm here with Dr. John Bartimus, one of the legends of the early practice accelerator and someone whose practice is really focused on this area, right, immune health. Um, so what is your, you know, come to this conference and now running practice successfully for a number of years, what, what's your tip for the practitioner community? Um, I think that when you're out there in practice, obviously you want to get results as clinicians. I would encourage you, obviously, get the best results you can, but to take functional medicine to its rightful place as 21st century healthcare, I think we need to focus on outcomes that are reproducible, that we can show other people um, how to do and then track. So not only subjective outcomes, like did the patient's symptoms improve, but objective outcomes like, hey, the beginning labs were this, the midterm labs were this, the, the end of care labs were this, and maybe other scans you're doing too, like an endopat or a max pulse or the other things. As many objective markers we have that, that we can use to show improvement and that what we really do works at the level of like, say, uh, an insurance company or a government would honor, I think that's very important. All right, I'm here with Leisha, who is one of the nurse practitioners at Turnbull Health. And uh, Leisha, what's something that you've uh, that you gathered from this weekend that you'll be taking back to practice? Yeah, so I love um, coming to conferences like this that really kind of give us protocols and templates to follow. Because sometimes in clinical, and it just, the patients have so much to say about every aspect of their life. Even as a provider, it gets almost confusing. You know, they, they've got this problem and this problem, but when you come together in a conference and really boil it down into these clearly defined silos of thinking and protocols, it just, it helps you take care of patients so much better because I am the boss, yeah. right? But I am deeply involved with my patients, so I just, often find that I'm getting lost in everything that they're saying and 
overall, these protocols would be very, very helpful. How do you how do you think about um, you know like a, a patient comes in and they're in this zone that we're talking about here today, like immune dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction? How do you think about ordering the care for patients? Yeah, so just really, again, thinking about it in a, a designated way. So start with this. I really like what we got yesterday. It's like, well, let's start with like brain inflammation and then move forward in this designated pattern. It just kind of helps you, um, again, like be the boss and be in charge of everything. Yeah. It's really beneficial. So I know at our office, we don't have all of the testing that um, is recommended. Some of the testing that was being talked about is really complicated, right? Yeah. It's like this blood draw has to sit for this amount of time that it can shift on dry ice and kind of just stepping back and saying, okay, well, how can I still learn from this without having every single tool that the research experts have yeah. applying that to your everyday practice? It's always going to be a challenge, yeah. but it's fun too. And there's so much that we can do for every patient who's coming in, you know, with all the tools that you've got there. So thanks so much for uh, the great tip and keep Thank up the good go. work. Thank you. All right. So implementation is everything. And one of our long-term sponsors at the Functional Forum is the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center. And with mitochondria, as with everything, they've got all the right tools uh, to help you with your patient education. Um, there's tear-off charts, mitochondria, recharging immune health. You can see and send that, give it right to the patient um, in the session. You can also see uh, there's the uh, patient handbook and the implementation kits, everything you need to start doing this kind of care in your practice tomorrow. So check out goevomed.com com slash LMRC. Find out more. Thanks. All right, I'm here with Dr. Jared Spencer. Just gave a great talk on the mind and mitochondria. Uh, Doc, what is a sports psychologist doing at a mitochondria conference and why is it relevant? Well, it's relevant because everyone here is a pro. They're the best at what they do. And even though sports psychology might have that kind of title that's geared towards athletes, the reality is it's the application of psychological principles to really high performance. And so when we think about healthcare providers, we think about those people that are really at the top of their field, but dealing with a lot of emotionality from the people that they're trying to help. Well, right now we've got a mental health crisis that we've never seen before. So what does that do for the emotional health of our healthcare providers? And the answer is it depletes them. It's, it's hard. We've got to do more. So just like a pro athlete, we've got to give them skills, outside in head knowledge, as well as inside out opportunities to talk about it so that they can thrive under pressure. It's the same for these healthcare providers. Yeah. And that's what I was doing today. You just had a great session and then a QA. and a What did you learn in this experience about how your work reflects on these practitioners or is relevant to these practitioners? That people are people. That no matter who we are or what we do or how much education we have or how experienced we are or something or how young or how old or whatever it may be, people are people. And we all struggle with the emotional aspects of life, but we also can find great healing and value and support in a pathway through that stuff if we really open our minds to this pathway of psychology. That's awesome. You know, one, one thing that's plaguing medicine is what some people would probably call burnout, but has been reframed as what they call moral injury like working inside a system that they don't believe in these practitioners have sort of made their way out to try and do something that um, is resonant uh, with the way that they see the world and the way, way they see disease how important is, is that journey as a foundation to um, thriving well if we're really talking about health care and caring for a person's health then what we're doing here what we're seeing from these individuals is really important because we don't want to just cater to sickness and illness we want as I often do as sports psychologists, we're working on human flourishing and thriving. And how can we get a person to be functionally at their best? What's the way to optimize? And so if we take the concepts that we know in healthcare and we apply that to the individual, we may have to do that outside of the typical model, then we can find those individuals that we can begin to serve. And they have uh, health and they've got uh, opportunities to perform at their highest levels. And other people see that and they say, well, who did you work with? And how do I get to that person? And how can they help me? And so I applaud those people that are willing to go that path. Well, Doc, thanks for being a, a breath of fresh air in this conference. I think that, you know, for a lot of practitioners, they, they need a little bit of that uh, as part of an overall conference experience. And appreciate you bringing it. Thanks so much. Here's some of the best bits from Dr. Jared Spencer. Clear mind, better performance. That's what we talk about in the sports world when I'm working as a sports psychologist. But as a health psychologist, we say clear mind, 
better health. I want you to take your finger like this here, turn the person next to you, touch him in the head and tell him, clear mind, better health, go. Tell him, uh, go ahead, tell him, tell him. Yes, clear mind, better health. We know that the mind is so important when it comes to health, and we know that the mind and the mitochondria are linked. You've seen the data. You've seen the research that's out there, right? We've heard already speakers yesterday and today touching on it and driving it home. I'm here today not to go down that path in, in too much of a clinical sense, but instead, instead I'm here today to share a message with you of hope. A message for you that a lot of what you're learning is so that you can help other people but in my time with you together today I want to share a message with you so that you can help you we've learned a lot about mitochondria and obviously we know the connections with mental health how heavily impacted in, uh, they're, they are heavily impacted in learning, memory, cognition, virtually every mental and neurological affliction, true, right? We know that building a bioenergetic uh, psychobiology, <laughs> by the way, I, made, I created a major in college called psychobiology, and what all my fraternity brothers asked me was, what are you gonna do with that? I had no idea. They would say to me, what are you going to hypnotize fish for a living? <laughs> and so a framework can stimulate the health sciences in three main ways. You can read the rest. Another article here, Picard in the stress uh, research pioneer McEwen, who died earlier this year, a couple of years back, published a meta-analysis of 23 studies on mitochondria and anxiety. Oh my gosh, anxiety, right? Just nod your head if you're seeing an increased rise in anxiety, right? And so the connection with that is so significant. 19 demonstrated significant adverse effects of physiological stress on mitochondria. And so there we establish a connection between the mind and mitochondria but this is where we pivot, and I say to you, working in healthcare is emotional, isn't it? But if we're being really honest, like along your journey, your training, your expertise, like how much education and skill development did you receive on how you were to manage the emotionality of those people that you're helping, right? Mental health is like the gorilla beating its chest. And it stares in front of you again and again and again, whether the patient's talking about it or not, as a root part of their problem. And if we're being really honest with each other, mental health is also looking at us in the mirror. It's in the office. But we're all so busy. It's with your kids. But we're so focused on performance and score and outcome and achievement and results. How'd the test go at school today? Coach say anything about the game coming up? That we never really get to the part of, how are you? Like, how are you really doing? And for somebody who goes room to room, talking to people, who asks you how you're really doing? I think we're missing the mental health in healthcare for our providers a lot more. Would you agree with that? Yes. Now I know what some of you are thinking. Jared, I'm good with all that, but seriously, seriously. How many passes were there? How many of you said 15 passes? 15 passes? You're wrong. How many of you said 14 passes? How many of you said 14 passes? It's the first time you saw the video and you saw the gorilla. Raise your hand. Wow. Give it up for them. Give it up. That's actually really, really, really impressive. That's impressive. And so here's what I want to talk to you about. As we talk about mitochondria, we talk about energy. I want to talk to you about your emotional 
energy management. How's your emotional energy management? And the definition of emotional energy is this. Read it out loud together. Ready? One, two, three, go. Now, emotional energy is measured on a self-report scale. Uh, zero to 100. It's like an A on a report card is uh, really good. If your emotional energy is up that high, you've got this psychological capacity. It's about your capacity to effectively, of course you can deal with all problems, but on the other side of you, what does it feel like? How effective are you at this very moment to deal with the problem? And if your emotional energy is up in the 90s, great. In the 80s, is like a B on a report card. Not bad, pretty good. In the 70s, you start to feel fatigue creeping in, but you're still positive. End of the day, right? Well, how many more do I have to see? <laughs> right? You're, 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 you're trying to gauge your emotional energy because at 70 is their tipping point number. After 70, negative thinking creeps in. And you begin to quickly unravel 65, 60, 55, right? And you begin to really spiral down. Now, if you're seeing a patient who's dealing with chronic pain, what do you think they might rate their emotional energy at each day, right? And how's their transference then, right? And so you can see how important this emotional energy scale is when you think like if you were to give these patients a number, what would you give them and where are you at relative to this process? Because if you can stay above 70 throughout your whole shift, you're gonna be fine. All right, happy to see one of my favorite functional medicine doctors, Dr. Christopher Moat. Doc, actually, I think we met four years ago at this equivalent conference, and um, just love to get your thoughts on uh, that conference and then coming back to this and why you keep coming back to these events. Yeah, well, there's such great information, and I really like to hang out with everybody. It's awesome. Um, but the biggest thing I got last time we were here is that I took what was essentially uh, 18 years of functional medicine, but realized the missing component of my clinical paradigm was the biotoxin-related illness. And so uh, Dr. Heyman unpacked everything the last time we were together, and it really allowed me and equipped me to start treating patients, first of all, pattern recognition and understanding the patients where that was a problem, and then what to do about it. Now, four or five years later, I feel like we've got that experience where we're able to add another level of precision and to even understand why we're doing what we're doing and I'm excited to go back and be more clinically effective. So this is pretty cool stuff. It's mind blowing. So your name is Cornerstone, right? And it is this biotoxin illness is now like a solid part of your overall um, practice abilities. Yeah, unfortunately, I deal with way too many patients who have that kind of complexity. But now it is absolutely a corner cornerstone piece of our clinical paradigm. What are some things that that you found this weekend that um, you can see that in four years when you come back, you say, "Hey, I'll have this down." If I understand the question correctly, I, I think the piece that I'm missing is that it may not just be mold and mycotoxins, but there could be other ancillary infections and proteins and even airborne uh, uh, toxins that I can now test for and help patients to get past. Um, and then there's, on a cellular level, there's even things we can do, interventions that I am not doing, that I'm excited to see how they can reduce inflammation and symptomology in my patients. Okay. It's so great to come, uh, you know, at a certain uh, cadence and see practitioners implementing um, what they've learned and taking their practice to the new level. And I expect it from uh, someone like you, Dr. Mo. Thanks so much for, for being here. My pleasure. All right, we are here with Heather from Kerry Sutton's office. If you read my book and if you followed the Functional Forum for a long time, you know that we have talked about the orientation that they do at their practice as a great way in one, not only to get patients ready for the care they're about to receive, but also to get them used to uh, being in community and doing group visits. So Heather, I know um, maybe you can just share with us, you know, you're, you're here at the mitochondrial conference, you're learning uh, alongside, um, uh, alongside Kerry. Why do you come to, to these conferences? You know, I think uh, for me, when I'm talking to patients and trying to 
relate to their story. Number one, it's important for me to be well-spoken, right? To know what I'm talking about. I don't want to just sound salesy, um, but this is a good way for me to, to be in the know of what's happening in the functional medicine world. It's important. And so when our patients come into the practice, every single one of us on staff is educated and knowledgeable. So Awesome. So tell us about like the current state, because I know it's evolved pre-COVID and then first Carrie was doing it and then you were doing it and then it was COVID. So how are you running the uh, orientations now in the practice? Absolutely. So every patient that establishes with us um, goes through our orientation process. And we do this because we feel like patients, they need a, a transition process from traditional medicine to functional. It's very different. There's a lot of information to cover. We want them to come in knowing what they're doing and what it's going to be like, the experience. And so um, I have the privilege of doing that. I've done it virtually, I've done it in person. Um, and I think that it just welcomes people into functional medicine to make them comfortable with that transition. We know it's hard, right? Yeah. We know making that transition is hard. We know making changes is hard. And so our goal is to let them know that we're not just gonna be working on them, but really walking with them. And so it's really a privilege to get to know so many people through that orientation yeah. process and, and kind of be that first um, step that they take into our practice. It's amazing. Um, there's a lot of specific information on this topic. Could you see doing like a you know chronic infection like specialty one because especially I'm sure there's mold damage where you are right oh absolutely absolutely we're from um southwest Missouri the Ozarks uh, mold is just rampant there we've done many group visits and we feel like the group visits really are a good opportunity for community and so for us just finding those groups of patients who relate to each other can learn from each other and then just pouring into them as much as possible the orientation was the first step for us in group visits and we've evolved um through that and and who knows what we'll do in the future Amazing. Well, we will put the details in the show notes. Actually, we'll put a link um, to the first interview that I did with Kerry and her, her team, because ultimately I think you guys are really breaking new ground and showing best practices. And, you know, as a, as a side note, if you really want to build a successful practice, bring your team to conferences like this. You see how it gets, uh, you know, it gets uh, Heather fired up to be part of the, the practice. Absolutely. So thanks so much for all your pioneering work and check out the next segment. All right, we are here with Dr. Elroy Vajdani, and as is typical in these conferences, um, we need someone to really ground how to take this into practice the next day, because if there's an unlimited number of things that you could do, how do you really start to build the foundations of a strong mitochondrial practice? So, Doc, that's your role uh, here this weekend, and, um, you know, for practitioners who, you know, may be um, functional medicine focused and have not really been able to implement this kind of care into their practice, looking at these these types of conditions, you know, what is going to be your your message, uh, your overall message for practitioners to sort of ground into integrating some of this into their practice? My message is pretty clear that, you know, we talk about immunological dysfunction, inflammation all the time. Um, you know, that's really synonymous with mitochondrial dysfunction. So, you know, my, my point is showing the evidence that the mitochondria and the immune system are one-to-one -one connected to each other. And when you discover immunological dysfunction in a clinical setting, you have to keep that in the back of your mind and incorporate mitochondrial treatment into that immune treatment. How do you think about when you see an um, you know, autoimmune or you know, immune dysfunction case, how do you see prioritizing mitochondria over, let's say, the gut and other things that um, might be a, an obvious uh, starting point for treatment? Yeah, you know, it's really come to the point for me now that it's the foundation of the treatment. You know, I think to myself, okay, there is this mitochondrial dysfunction that's at the base of the immunological dysfunction. So if I'm going to enable and enhance and optimize the immune system, I have to consider mitochondrial support as the foundation of that and then go into the layers above it. If you look back um, at the pandemic and you see, you know, America um, not, not doing so well with, with COVID, um, do you think there's a, a mitochondrial element there, a metabolic component? I think that experience is what opened my mind and eyes to the idea that the mitochondria are so paramount to the immune system. It was a discovery that people with pre-existing mitochondrial dysfunction suffer the most. And then also when we did our research and we were looking at the autoimmune profiles of patients with severe COVID, we found that they had a higher propensity to have anti-mitochondrial and anti-cardiolipin antibodies. It became extremely clear that this was the thing that was the most movable piece for us. So that experience solidified it for me. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, I'm really excited, uh, you know, to to have some of your your content in here. Um, I guess just as a as a last piece, you know, um, what are some of the what are some of the key recommendations that you look to uh, for building that that mitochondria foundation? I, I think it's really just about making sure that the mitochondria have a very robust antioxidant support profile built in and that it's very diverse. You know, the, the mitochondria respond to many things given to them at one time. So build a diverse and very robust mitochondrial profile. All right. Well, we are going to get into some of Dr. Vojtani's uh, content that he shared at the conference. Enjoy some of the best bits. Again, where did we see the role of mitochondria, I think, become so apparent in everything as far as human health is concerned, or at least, you know, researchers and physicians who didn't, you know, have the early experiences or knowledge of this, COVID, particularly long COVID. And, and I came to this appreciation actually through research that my dad and I did in 2020 and then 2021, and I'll tell you guys that story. Um, but, you know, essentially, long COVID is a very complicated thing but it can be broken down into six different mechanisms. And most patients with long COVID have several of these mechanisms going on. Starting at the 12 o'clock uh, position, persistence of virus or its remnants, going clockwise, reactivation of latent viruses, dominantly Epstein-Barr virus and HHV6. Small studies, the only clinical data that we have so far, argue that somewhere between 60 to 70% of long COVID patients have reactivation of either EBV or HHV6. Viral superantigen activation of the immune system, this is basically spike plus uh, um, a modulator taking a already inflamed immune system and turning it into a more heightened pro-inflammatory state. We know a lot about how COVID spike protein cause intestinal permeability and change in the microbiome. There is direct mitochondrial injury as a hallmark of long COVID and multi-tissue damage through mechanisms of autoimmunity, predominantly neuroautoimmune disease. Now, if you look at every single one of these, you can make a very strong argument that the mitochondrial injury is a component to every single one of those pieces. The persistence of virus or its remnants, remember I said a damaged mitochondria and inflammation, one of the hallmarks is an incapacity to deal with viruses. Reactivation of latent viruses like EBV or HHV6, the T cell weakening that occurs that allows for these latent viruses to wake up can be directly linked to the mitochondrial injury in those T cells. Disturbance of the gut can be highly linked to mitochondrial injury there. We, of course, have the direct mitochondrial dysfunction. And as I'll show you, what we found in our initial research looking at COVID-induced autoimmunity, that there was markers of direct damage to the mitochondria caused by cross-reactivity between spike and nucleocapsid antibodies and the mitochondria itself. So yes, there is neurological autoimmunity as part of long COVID, but there is also mitochondrial autoimmunity as part of long COVID. This is more just kind of discussing that mitochondrial metabolic difference. So I'm gonna just go to our graphical representation here. So the question always from an immunological perspective is, why did some individuals have virtually no issue with COVID versus others have dramatic issues either with the acute illness or long-term ramifications? If you look in the upper right-hand corner in that blue box, the way a viral infection is supposed to work is essentially through the course of the viral infection, we should be inducing apoptosis of the infected cell. That prevents replication, and then you can send out stress signals to activate the immune system further. When you have a viral infection, you're gonna get damaged mitochondria, of course. So in a healthy, balanced, metabolically balanced individual, they have antioxidant reserve capable of dealing with the oxidative push to that mitochondria, and it allows them to function appropriately, and those mitochondria, are, when they're infected and damaged, can signal and undergo mitophagy. So a healthy immune response is dictated by being able to 
clear the infected and damaged cells and to clear the infected and damaged mitochondria. Now, if you have an individu individual that is metabolically unhealthy going into a COVID infection, what happens to their mitochondria? What happens to their immune system? So they are no longer oxidative phosphorylation dominant in the mitochondria. They're running on aerobic glycolysis. So the churn rate for that mitochondria is much higher. Essentially, each molecule of glucose is going to produce far fewer ATP, meaning they are going to produce far higher amounts of reactive oxygen species, meaning they are far less likely to have antioxidant reserve. Those cells that are infected cannot undergo apoptosis, and those mitochondria that are damaged through the course of the infection cannot undergo mitophagy. So it's the inability to clear out the infected cells that allows the perpetual inflammatory and autoimmune responses, and it is mitochondrial health that is at the center of that. Another way that that's very clearly demonstrated in COVID is some patients who are infected end up with really significant congestive heart failure afterwards, and as Dr. Kaiser said, you know, he sees uh, congestive heart failure or a heart attack as a mitochondrial disruption. I think that's absolutely true. You know, I used to think of a, a heart attack as an acute and inflammatory event. That's what we were taught in medical school, and then, you know, several years of practicing through an autoimmune and inflammatory lens, that's how I thought about it as well, too. But if you want to go a layer deeper than that, it is absolutely a mitochondrial dysfunction that triggered an inflammatory event. So to tell the story of how my appreciation for the central role of mitochondria in immunological health happened, uh, we'll go to this paper that my dad and I published in Frontiers uh, at the beginning of 2021. But we started doing this research in September of 2020. And the way this basically happened was, you know, I was in clinical practice in LA. We had a fair share of people who had, you know, early acute COVID infections in the practice. Um, you know, we really didn't know how to handle them or what to do with them at the time. And the biggest issue that we started seeing was obviously really dramatic loss of quality of life for several months following the infection. And, you know, I remember getting together with my dad, I think during the summer of summer of 2020, and said, you know, we had just finished the whole round of research in the neurodegenerative space. So we had published in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. We had three big papers that we published there. And um, this wasn't necessarily a logical shift for us. We were thinking to continue to go in that direction. But, you know, I kind of pulled him aside when we were hanging out one afternoon and said, listen, we have to throw our hat into this game. It, it's just, uh, you know, as much as anybody can contribute to this, they have to. I said, you know, we could tell at that point early on in studies just by doing mapping studies of spike protein that there was a lot of um, epitope similarity between spike in human tissue. What does that mean? That means that if you were to generate an antibody to spike, if there was a tissue in your body that had 70 to 80 percent similarity to spike, that antibody would bind to that tissue because antibodies are not 100 percent specific. That's the whole basis of cross-reactivity and molecular mimicry. That's how autoimmunity is formed in the first place. So there were early signals based on computer sequencing data that said that there was a lot of cross-reactive epitopes between spike and human tissue. So, you know, we basically said, let's do this for real. So we purchased monoclonal antibodies against spike and monoclonal antibodies against nucleocapsid. What, what are those? To bring you back to what early treatment looked like at the end of 2020, we had monoclonal antibody infusions. Those are basically humanized monoclonal antibodies against specific targets. That's exactly what we used. So we took the monoclonal antibodies against spike and nucleocapsid, and we reacted them with 55 different tissue antigens that the computer sequencing said were likely to be potential cross-reactive targets. And we essentially looked in, in the real world, you know, not, not within a human being, but at least in actual potential for reactivity, what cross-reactivity is there likely to occur if, let's say, somebody has an antibody against spike, what tissue can it bind to? So what we found both for spike and nuclear protein, much more for nuclear protein than for spike, was that there, in the star over there that you see on the right, extremely high cross-reactivity to mitochondrial antigens. 
We knew that people were suffering from significant fatigue in, in that post-COVID state, so it made a lot of sense that not only was there direct mitochondrial injury from the viral infection, but the autoimmune cascade could also be directly contributing to that. We also found, and I highlighted that in the red box, that there was a significant amount of phospholipid antibodies. You've heard the term phospholipid several times, I think, today and yesterday. Those are uh, portions of the membrane, both the outer and inner membrane of all cells, in particular the mitochondria. Other things, we found very high cross-reactivity TPO, GAD65, the neurologic antibodies showed a lot of cross-reactivity as well too, but the ones that stood out to us at least initially, and this is nucleoprotein, were the phospholipid and the mitochondria because, in, again, with what we were seeing in clinic, fatigue was a very dominant issue, fatigue and, and brain fog. So it looked like there was a direct autoimmune mechanism in which the antibodies generated are going to damage the mitochondria of the individual, which will perpetuate what initially happens during the course of the infection. An individual can get mitochondrial damage through any viral infection. But if the immune system is going to continue to propagate that damage, they are going to have a very hard time recovering. Now, this is, you know, kind of like a graphical map of where we found the significant cross-reactions to. Um, and there are a lot of clinical papers now coming showing, you know, extremely high rates of connective tissue autoimmune diseases in people following COVID infections and vaccination. Um, and we'll have to continue to keep an eye on this. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Functional Forum. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something. Next month, we will have opportunities to ask questions of doctors who are implementing this with patients every week. Uh, Dr. Eric Lundquist, Dr. Kelly McCann, and uh, you can ask your questions. So look forward to that coming up next month. We look forward to seeing you there. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.